is Diana Cullella and one uh, of uh, the lecturers at the University of Liverpool. And it's uh, fantastic. It's a great pleasure to be uh, delivering this sort of course workshop on um, a Spanish poetry from the, the post-war um, period. So it's also uh, a very auspicious day to start the course. Uh, it's El Día del Libro, it's a book day. So we're celebrating the uh, anniversaries of the deaths of Cervantes, Shakespeare, or, or you know, the approximate date in which they um, died. The sessions, uh, as you can see there, so we'll have five sessions. Today, an introduction to this, um, the Spanish Civil War, its consequences for Spanish literature. But tomorrow, we will be reading um, Blas de Otero. So on Monday, we'll be reading uh, Gil de Vietma um, on the generation of the 50s. Then on Wednesday, uh, Luis de Nuda. And then the last, day and um, we'll see the relevance of a Spanish post-war poetry for literature today. I'll start with the introduction to uh, the Spanish Civil War and its consequences for Spanish literature. As you know, the Spanish Civil War um, is without a doubt one of the most well-known, one of the most researched uh, um, and studied historical events uh, of the 20th century in Spain, as are the years of the Franco dictatorship. This uh, has captured the imagination of generations, yeah? Um, in Spain, even more so since the uh, Ley de la Memoria Histórica, the, the historical memory law, was passed in 2007. This was a law that uh, recognized the victims of both sides of the war, um, gave them rights, uh, gave uh, rights to their descendants, condemned the uh, Francoist regime. And, and also, we've got, if, if you follow Spanish literature, um, you will have seen loads of novels that deal um, um, with the civil war. There are loads of novels uh, talking about the Spanish Civil War, talking about the post-war period, hmm? as it is a period that has captured the imagination, yeah? The, uh, the, the interest of, um, of loads um, and loads of people. However, the poetry written during this period uh, has not managed to seize the same um, attention. There are many reasons for that. Um, this poetry has been considered by some as not a very good poetry, um, of not the same level as the poetry that we had seen just before the war. But also it's quite misunderstood, yeah? Uh, people tend to study um, the poetry of the post-war period as a big block, yeah? The poetry of the post-war period. So 40 years of a worth of poetry in just one block. So that's not really what we should be doing, yeah? Um, and the way uh, I'll explain it later, I've break it down uh, with the generation of the 36, generation of the 50s, the poetry in exile, just to break it down um, a little bit. It just talks about the, the, um, the events in case someone is not very familiar with this. Okay, so obviously, you know, before the Spanish Civil War, we had the Second Republic, before it finished um, with the military rising in July 1936, um, and the monarchy was ousted. This is what the monarch said at um, the time. Um, obviously, with the Spanish Civil War, this is how Spain looked. Okay, in 1936, um, you've got there the nationalists and the republicans, um, and I've given this title Las dos Españas, as we will see a poem by Blas de Otero talking about the Españas in plural, okay? Um, so this is how the map of Spain looked in 1936, okay? Um, the nationalists were backed by Germany to Portugal and Ireland, and the Republicans were backed by um, USSR and Mexico. Basically, um, the uh, Republicans were seen as the anti-Catholic movement, okay? Uh, the Spanish Republic was a lay state, um, 
Catholics were seen as, uh, at the time, as ultra conservatives. There had been multiple attacks on uh, church pro um, property, etc., um, which obviously influenced uh, what happened there. You've got the map again. Look how it looked 30 months later. Yeah, and um, how things had changed you can see the nationalists gaining um uh, loads of terrain and now the republicans just broken uh okay um in two um big uh, groups until uh in 1939 we get to the end of the war and franco said you know uh in el día de hoy cautivo y desarmado el ejército rojo so uh, basically announcing the end uh, of uh, the spanish civil war you've got a video there of um uh, franco uh, just giving a speech after winning um the civil war uh, and proclaiming um the totalitarian state <laughs> el funcionamiento de todas las capacidades y energías del país, en el que dentro de la unidad nacional, el trabajo, estimado como el más inemotivo de los deberes, será el único exponente de la voluntad popular. Y me interpreta él, podrá manifestarse el auténtico sentido del pueblo español a través de aquellos órganos naturales que como la familia, el municipio, la asociación y la corporación harán cristalizar en realidades nuestro ideal supremo. Obviously, this followed, this was followed by what's known as the dictatorship. Okay, which lasted until Franco's death in 1975. This meant that, you know, um, we had a totalitarian state, anti-liberal, anti-communist, a democracia organica, lack of constitution. There was suppression of individual freedom. Okay, a Spain was proclaimed a Catholic state. Um, there was the suppression of regionalisms, nationalisms, and obviously, and this will affect poetry, we had censorship and control of media. Okay, you will have seen um, novels on YouTube, yeah, uh, which were a screen um before films during the dictatorship just uh, propaganda of the regime but poetry couldn't be understood outside the immediate context surrounding you yeah that poetry at the time needed to make sense for the people they were writing for so that's what it's quite important to know the context yeah so um we can also divide yeah, this uh post-war periods in two big blocks maybe the immediate post-war period so from when the war ended in 1939 to the late 50s it's the most isolated period in Spain yeah uh, due basically to not taking part in the second world war and um, poverty underdevelopment was massive in Spain and, it, and we had self-sufficient economy Things changed in the 1960s, okay, when there was an economic boom, the end of isolation, hmm? uh, international relationships started to be re-established, um, there was the creation of a strong middle class, uh, laws were relaxed a little bit, attitudes were more permissive, hmm? so that's why we can see these two different um, blocks in, in the dictatorship, which will affect, yeah, um, the, definitely the, um, the poetry that we will be reading. From the, the structure of the uh, course, that we have no women in the course, yeah? It doesn't mean that we didn't have women poets. We did have women poets, but obviously they were not as well known as the male poets for obvious reason. Obviously during the dictatorship, as you can see on the screen, uh, gender roles were oh, occupied. So women had to be La Perfecta Casada, El Ángel del Hogar. Um, and obviously that didn't go very well with poetry. And they were not enjoying the same education, but we do have um, um, 
women poets. I'm tempted to add Ernestina de Champurcin uh, when we look at Luis Cernuda and just provide the translations myself. So if you can bear with a very poorly translated piece, I'll, I'll do that and I'll translate them myself. The made up this is actually something that women received during the the uh, post-war period yeah no te quejes so be, be obedient to your husband um uh, etc um and you've got frank goes last year's there okay so uh, until we get to the transition and we will see how um yeah he's, this is the announcement that franco had died um, so basically, um, when we uh, when we look at um, the the effects of this poetry um, in in contemporary poetry, um, we'll see how authors, contemporary authors, look back to uh, post-war poetry, but also to this moment of the transition. Okay, so that will be uh, quite important. The moment when um, Spain abandoned the dictatorship and jumped uh, into democracy. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little bit about post-war poetry um, in general. Hmm? So, um, in many and very obvious ways, uh, the Spanish Civil War had a long-term negative effect okay, on, on the possibilities of poetic production, as you can imagine. The destruction of uh, war, the focus on actual survival, yeah? um, during and after the conflict, uh, the conflict would make literary activity seem also almost like a, a luxury. Yeah? If you had to go without something, that would be poetry. Hmm? If you were wondering where your next meal would come from, you would not be thinking about writing poetry. Hmm? So let's say that you know, the circumstances were not the best uh, for, for poetry. Um, also, the use of propaganda, uh, of using poetry as propaganda, limited creative, creative goals, um, let's say. Hmm? At the end of the war, when the nationalists emerged uh, victorious, the country found itself in a climate of ideological concerns, underpinned by censorship, okay? Um, also works from poets that were writing in Spain, in Spanish from Latin America were forbidden, so people could not read works by Pablo Neruda, for example. Um, they, were, they didn't know, yeah, what um, the Hispanic letters were aware at the time. Equally important, um, the poets residing um, in Spain had been massively decimated, yeah? Just think of poets that, ex that existed before the Spanish Civil War. Antonio Machado went into exile and died three days just after crossing the border into France, yeah, in, in Colura. Um, so he died. Federico García Lorca, one of the most important poets, yeah, a celebrity at the time, was killed at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. So those poets that would have been having an impact, a massive impact on Spanish poetry, were disappearing for one reason or another. The rest of the members of the generation of 27, Luis Ternuda, Pedro Salinas, Jorge Guillén, they all had to go into exile. So, um, you know, the, the poets in, there, uh, in, in the country had been completely decimated. It would be years before academic and literary institutions would function freely or effectively. For all these reasons, um, the intellectual atmosphere of the 1940s would be quite narrow. It would be a very impoverished one, as, as um, you can um, imagine. Given the circumstances, the, the fact that we've got some poetry is quite an achievement, yeah? So it's something that we need to recognize to be able to enjoy poetry that had been written under that um, was uh, amazing. I can see someone loves Lorca. Yeah, Lorca is amazing. So uh, obviously he's not from the post-war period, but if, we'll, if we have time, we'll read some Lorca um, at the end uh, of, of the course, yeah? Because obviously Lorca was a massive influence for the poets of the post-war period. So we'll see how 
Um, in the 1940s, actually, um, not many books were published. So there were very, very important magazines, okay, that started um, to appear. And these magazines we've got, um, for example, um, Espadaña, okay, was founded in 1944 in Leon, and Espadaña published a poetry that was very different to the one that we had seen in the few years immediately after the war. Yeah, as you can imagine, just after the war and the poets that got published were very uh, aligned to the Francoist regime and it was a very classical poetry. Mm -hmm. um, Espadaña in the 1940s, in the mid 1940s, a magazine started publishing, publishing just, you know, random poems here and there of um, authors that had very different ideas, yeah, um, of authors that wanted to use that magazine as the vehicle for new forms of expression, to um, express individual suffering, yeah, to express what people in Spain at the time were going through. Mm -hmm. um, so between 1945 and 1951, um, Espadaña published a large volume of uh, poetry of verse reflecting sort of existential, yeah, and social concern. We'll see how, you know, this existentialism, who are we, why are we alive, where are we going, what, what, why are we here, hmm? these will be concerns that we will see echoed in all this poetry all the time. Vicente um, Alexandre, who is one of the authors of the generation of 27 that remained in Spain, he didn't go into exile because he was very um, ill, so his very poor health meant that he couldn't go into exile and, the, and really the dictatorship didn't see him as a threat, yeah, because, you know, he was so ill that he was um, defenseless basically. Um, so in 1955, uh, in an essay and in a speech, um, in which he defined the essential theme of the current poetry, he said that it was el cántico del hombre en cuanto situado, es decir, en cuanto localizado, localizado en un tiempo, en un tiempo que pasa y es irreversible, y localizado en un espacio, en una sociedad determinada, con unos determinados problemas que les son propios. So the, the English version is, um, this poetry is the poetry of the man situated, of a man that is located, located in a time, in a time that passes and is irreversible, that is located in a place, in a specific society, in specific problems that belong to it. So, as you can see in here, we've got this poetry uh, that deals with immediate issues and that would become dominant for nearly two decades. One could say that post-Civil War poetry had prompted a break um, from the universalism or irrationality of other traditions, of past traditions, and that we now had have a stress hmm, on personal dilemmas, on uh, personal experiences, on social issues. Hmm? People wanted to talk about what was going on, what they felt was important. Hmm? Some poets even said, you know, poetry is not eternal. We're not here to talk about roses when people are dying of hunger. Hmm? So they wanted to talk about something that would be relevant. Hmm? not just to them as writers, but also to the readers, to the people that would be reading them. And obviously that meant that they had to develop a completely new style, um, completely new narrative techniques that they would need to employ a very, you know, easy language or that looked easy, okay? Um, a direct address, addressing people, addressing God, uh, addressing an audience uh, directly hmm, with everyday language. Um, Gabriel Celaya, who is a very well-known author, uh, a poet of the 1936 generation, wanted to connect this poetry to um, everyday expression. Hmm? He said, cantemos como quien respira, hablemos de lo que cada día nos ocupa, 
no hagamos poesía como quien va al quinto cielo o como quien posa para la posteridad. La poesía no es, no puede ser intemporal. So let us sing as one breathes. Let us speak of what concerns us every day. Let us not make poetry as if we were seeking the fifth heaven or like those who pose for posterity. So there was this um, need yeah, of, of just talk about things that felt important. Um, Blas de Otero wanted to avoid a simplistic view yeah, and indicated that poetry's role was demostrar hermandad con la tragedia viva y luego, lo antes posible, intentar superarla. So the role of poetry was to show brotherhood, a link, a connection to um, the living tragedy that was war and the post-war period and afterwards very soon to try to rise above it so they saw poetry as a tool to overcome the despair of uh, the post-war period there have been um, academics and critics that they have that have said maybe we should just talk about a uh, poesia de testimonio like a sort of a witness, poetry as a witness, and avoid talking about themes, um, etc. So Blas de Otero, Gabriel Celaya, the authors of the generation of the 36, had lived the Spanish Civil War as adults. Uh, some of them had taken part in it, so they had really experienced the Spanish Civil War. The poets of the 50s had lived the Spanish Civil War as children. So they had a completely different understanding, a different perspective of what it all meant. Um, for them, war was something that they had heard of. Obviously, they had felt the consequences, maybe being hungry or, or you know, having family members who had died during the conflict. But obviously, it's very different to experience a war when you are fighting in it or where you are a child. We'll see how Hilde Vietma actually says in one of his poems that the, the years of the Spanish Civil War were the happiest years of his life because he was secluded in the countryside trying to avoid war. So for him, that was wonderful. So let's see um, the um, sort of existential poetry in the 1940s, in the mid-1940s. We're starting basically in 1944. This is a poetry that is trying to get away from the pure poetry, anything experimental that had been done before the Spanish Civil War, and is trying to um, realign itself, come up with new different strategies. We've got authors like um, Vicente Alexandre and Damaso Alonso, who were members of the Generación del 27, even writing books on, on this style, on really ex existential po um, poetry. So Vicente Alexandre um, wrote um, Sombra del Paraíso, Damaso Alonso, uh, Hijos de la Ira, both were published in 1944. Hmm? But as we will see tomorrow, Blas de Otero is the author of some of the most impressive existential verse in uh, Spain. He was brought up uh, in religious schools, trained as uh, a lawyer, um, and he published his first book in 1942. It was called Cantico uh, Espiritual, so a direct reference to uh, San Juan de la Cruz, Fray Luis de, de León. But in that work, he already suggests that he's struggling with faith, with who he is, so all these existential um, matters. And the, this struggle becomes really real um, in the works that he publishes in 1950 and 1951, Ángel Fieramente Humano and um, Redoble de Conciencia. Uh, so I've got, uh, I've got in here the two books that were republished uh, in 1958 as Anthea, yeah, um, which is the first two letters of the first book, Angel Firamente Humano, and the last two of um, Redoble de Conciencia. Mm -hmm. So it's not a poetry um, that is just to, talking about existential problems 
in an abstract way, he's asking for uh, answers in, in that um, poem. But we'll see how this poetry also has amazing control hmm, through form and an image of feelings that could have easily engendered, you know, sentimental screaming, let's say. Hmm? So he talks about um, um, things very carefully. Hmm? Um, and he uses a, a, a very wide formal repertoire, hmm? different varieties of verse, forms, tones, rhythmic effects, uh, intertext, uh, discourse, um, etc. Um, so that's what we find in in the in the mid forties to the early fifties before this poetry turns more into something social. Yeah, and um, so it's still in a sense existential, but um, some of these poets um, that want to show solidarity with other human beings go a step further. So um, the, the, the social, the political themes start to be more obvious, maybe because the censorship at the time had relaxed a little bit, or at least at some point during the, the, the 50s, and they were more allowed to make more obvious references to political issues. Um, so there was, in the 50s, with this turn into a more social poetry, a goal of constructing a powerful new realistic literature hmm, that was suited to the um, circumstances, that was um, more than just testimonial. Hmm. Um, so, though envisioned by the poems that we uh, had seen uh, uh, in in the in the previous in the previous years, and in what we had seen in Espadaña being published. Um, there. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, these poets got in touch with the outside wall. So Blas de Otero, for example, moved to Paris for a while in the 50s, met um, communist authors, uh, joined communism. So he became much more socially and political aware if that was possible and obviously that influenced um his um his poetry massively hmm? um, gave it an awareness that it was lacking before so as the country's isolation from uh, europe was attenuated hmm? and when the united states and other countries re-established diplomatic relationships with um, spain um, the forbidden text by other authors by authors that were outside became available writers um, had an incentive to follow their lead and to compose something that was um, more um, political, um, let's say. Um, so as, as I've said, censorship was less absolute, although we will see some, some exceptions with Blas de Otero uh, tomorrow. And, and actually poetry seemed to be the one genre in which postures of protest were allowed to be published, yeah, surprisingly. So novels or theatre faced more censorship than poetry, which is quite surprising, but hey, we won't complain. Um, obviously in the 50s and 60s, uh, tourism started to uh, become a boom in Spain, and that meant new ideas, uh, uh, opening the country, and there was a shift in the focus of poetry from a personal anguish uh, reaction to larger themes, hmm? um, as well as some enrichment of the um, literary scene. And we will see how um, the poets of the 1950s, so the poets that started publishing in the very, very late 50s, in the early 60s, they said, well, listen, I mean, this poetry is fantastic, but we need to do more, yeah? We need to be more challenging. We need to write a poetry that is social and engaged, that it's, you know, it goes with what's happening. 
but we need to do it properly. So we will see how Jaime Gil de Vietma took it on board to move poetry from being communication, yeah, to being knowledge. This started a massive discussion in uh, between the poets on whether poesia needed to be communication, hmm? the, this uh, uh, communication or conocimiento. Hmm? Was poetry just a tool to communicate something or was it a tool, a tool so that you could learn, so that you would, could become better, so that you could discuss themes and issues that were important but in a more you know um cultivated way so we will see this shift into this poetry in the 1960s that looks more at the formal aspects without obviously um um ignoring the the political um aspects that uh, went um, with it um, and obviously, uh, in the 60s, uh, censorship was really, really diminished, which allowed poets in the 60s to really publish what um, they wanted, or almost what they wanted. Foreign literature, classic and current highbrow, lowbrow, as well as works by previously censored the Spanish writers uh, and exiled writers um, became available. New magazines and poetry series appeared, increasing publication outlets. Um, the Adonai series and the prize, which had been instituted in 1943 hmm, to stimulate poetry, had actually become um, a prestigious source and incentive for younger poets. So it is against this backdrop that new attitudes towards poetry developed, hmm? although the changing cultural scene had, uh, as I said, bearing effects on different writers. Hmm? It's quite interesting because obviously at, at the time we've got two generations writing at the same time hmm? with different perspectives, different views of what a social poetry uh, is. So as, uh, as I've said, you know, this uh, younger generation experienced the Spanish Civil War as children hmm, or adolescents. Um, so basically maybe as victims hmm, rather than as actors um, in it. Um, and, and obviously their, their, um, the way they were brought up, the teaching, the education that they received was also um, quite um, instrumental in what we will what we will see. Um, I wanted to read you something um, about how they saw this, this poetry. So um, Jose Angel Valente, uh, one of the poets of the 1950s, in one of his articles about comunicación, conocimiento y comunicación, so poetry as communication or just knowledge, said something quite interesting. He said, Todo poema es, pues, una exploración del material de experiencia no previamente conocido que constituye su objeto. El conocimiento más o menos pleno del poema supone la existencia más o menos plena del poema en cuestión. De allí que el proceso de la creación poética sea un movimiento de indagación y tanteo, porque todo poema es un conocimiento haciéndose. Every poem is therefore an exploration of the matter of experience not previously known, which constitutes its goal. The more or less complete knowledge of the poem supposes the more or less complete existence of the poem in question. Hence, the process of poetic creation is a process of investigation and testing, because all poem is knowledge in process of becoming. So they saw the poem as an act of discovery, not on, which not only contradicted the definition of poetry as message, mm -hmm. as, a, as a communication that had been prevalent um, in Spain, but also undermined the long-standing modern poetics of the literary work. Um, Hilde Vietma, we will see, elaborated this idea on several occasions and developed the notion of the poem as an interplay between the author and the reader. So while in the first generation the reader was important because they shared something, in here there is a massive expectation um, uh, from the 
the poet towards the reader. Yeah, the reader had have to deconstruct the poem, just find the meaning behind it. So we are asking a lot of the reader, as as we will see. But they still saw social poetry um, as you know a tool for uh, okay. the 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 betterment of the wall hmm? um, but it had to be coupled as i said with a successful poetic expression hmm? so uh, it had to be more than just uh, a uh, message hmm? it's been fantastic to uh, to have you all here i hope you have enjoyed it it's been maybe it's been a bit boring today but i just needed to give you this context um, uh, so that the poetry that we read from tomorrow onwards will make sense, yeah? Right, so I'll see you tomorrow at four o'clock. Okay, bye, thank you.